Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and I'm excited to say the time has finally come to stock the bass in the pond. And it has taken us a full year to get to this point, and since this is the one year anniversary of the pond build, I decided to show a few highlights of how we got to this point. Last June, we broke ground on the pond, and that's when we started working on the core trench and building up the dam. And as most of you know that followed the series, we didn't have good clay material on site, so we had to haul that in. So the pond build process started with getting that clay compacted around the dam, and that was pretty much like the backbone of the pond. And soon after that, we were able to bring the heavy machinery in and start the excavating. And this also took quite a while because we had to excavate a lot of dirt out of the shallow end of the pond and move it to the back side of the dam. And overall, we wanted the pond to have an average depth of 6 feet, with the deepest part of the pond being 12 feet deep. So this was definitely the most time-consuming part of the project, and we were basically just loading these big trailers with dirt, hauling it to the backside, and then repeating that process. And the guys that were doing the excavating added some cool features like underwater road beds, islands, humps, and ditches. So after weeks of excavating dirt, we were finally able to build the dam up and get everything compacted like we wanted. And that's a look on the day that the dam was completed. So we marked off the area that we were going to build the dock. And you can also see the island coming together there. So at this point, all of the excavation was complete. And the last step we had to do was line the entire pond with a two-foot clay blanket. And that took around 850 dump truck loads of clay. But that finally got us to the next step, which was my favorite part, and that was adding the structure. So we added several brush piles and some pea gravel beds for the bluegills to spawn. And I wanted to have some unique features like tunnels for them to swim through, shaded areas for them to hang out in. But my favorite piece of structure that we put in the pond is what I call the oak throne. And that was the root system of a 150 year old red oak tree. So here's a good look at the pond after we got all of the structure in and it was slowly starting to fill up with rainwater. So before it filled up, the next thing we needed to do was build the dock. And I wanted that dock to be right in the middle of all the action. So we put it close to the island, close to the oak throne, and I wanted to draw extra fish into this area. So we put in an underwater light system that has green glowing lights at night. And we'll be turning those on later in this video. And if we relied solely on rainwater to fill the pond up, it could have easily taken over a year. And since we didn't want to wait that long, we added an underground well with a five horsepower pump and started pumping water in at about 100 gallons per minute. So at this point, it was basically a waiting game. We had to sit back and let the pump do its thing. And as you can see, even though we had 100 gallons per minute going in, a five acre pond holds millions of gallons of water. And all in all, I think it took somewhere around 60 plus days to get it full enough to start stocking the fish. But we had this nice long dam built and we did not want to have future issues with erosion so we hydro seeded the dam and that's basically where they mix grass seeds in with this sticky tack material and spray it on the slopes of the dam so it'll hold in place long enough for those seeds to germinate and whenever you're building a bass pond before you add the bass you want to make sure that there's plenty of bait so we added 6,000 fathead minnows 6,000 bluegills and 10,000 threadfin shad And the final step to creating a perfect bass pond was getting the water parameters dialed in using a liming and fertilizing process. And we added 25 tons of lime throughout the pond and shortly after started our fertilizer program. And here we are one year later on the eve of adding the bass and enjoying a nice sunset out at the pond. But one of the things I kind of saved until this moment was these underwater green lights. So as I mentioned earlier, I wanted this dock to be the focal point of the pond and where most of the action was. And I knew by adding these underwater lights in, it would make it fun to come out and fish at night. But most importantly, it would draw all the bait in. So we installed three lights, two of them near the dock and the other one near the oak throne. And now you see what I mean about attracting fish. You can already see the threadfin shad are attracted to the lights. They're coming up making circles around it. And man, that gets me really excited to see all this bait in here because we have created the perfect bass habitat. And I can just picture right now, sitting out on this dock, plenty of nights, watching those fish feed right here at these green lights. But I came back later in the night after everything was pitch black dark and my goodness, look at all of the bait fish. The majority of those are threadfin shad, but now you can see why this process works so well. Whenever you stock the bait first, it gives them plenty of time to multiply and spawn and so you have tens of thousands of bait fish swimming around the pond at all different sizes. 
And although it takes a long time to get it set up like this, I can see now that it was 100% the way to go. So I'm back out here the next morning and we're right here in the middle of another shad spawn. And I'm doing my best to show you all on camera how many bait fish there are in the pond. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> Boy, that is a bass snack right there. Little baby thread fin. When you can reach down in the pond and grab them with your hand, you know they're loaded in here. Man, am I happy to see this guy. So we got Bond with Southeastern Pond Management, and let's go take a look at what he brought us. And here's our first look at some of the meanest, most aggressive, fastest growing bass fry you'll ever see. So by now, most of you have seen our aggressive pet bass Moby, and the best way I can describe it is if Moby spawned with a 10 pound bass, the result would look like this. So these are called F1 tiger bass, and over the years, biologists have studied genetics and crossbred fish to create this fast-growing, extremely aggressive fish. And the way this is done is by breeding a northern strain largemouth with a Florida strain largemouth. And the northern strains are extremely aggressive, and the Florida strain grow really big, but they're lazy. And so when you take 100% pure northern male bass and spawn it with 100% pure Florida strain female bass, you basically get a tank full of little mobies. And so when you're stocking a bass pond, you want to have about 1,500 bluegills per acre and anywhere between 75 and 100 bass per acre. And I've chose to go with the lower end. We're going to put in 75 bass per acre, and that'll create a little less competition, and there should be more food per bass. So the way this process works is Bond is going to hand count all of the bass out and put them in a bucket. And the water in the tanks on this truck is only about 70 degrees. And our pond water is pushing 90 degrees, so we're going to have to spend 20 to 30 minutes acclimating the bass before we can put them into the pond. So these bass all hatched this spring, maybe a month or two ago, and they're around 2 inches long right now. And it's amazing to see that their color patterns have already developed, and they look like an adult bass. But one of the cool things we want to do while we're acclimating them is we want to show you how aggressive they are. So we're going to catch some of the small fry out of the pond and feed them. So we don't want to go with anything too big, so Bond's catching some of the smallest fry right there in the grass. Oh, he got him immediately. Yeah. <laughs> got him. Right there on the surface. Got him. Man, it is crazy to think that these fish are basically in captivity, have been transported across the state, sitting in a five-gallon bucket, and they still have enough aggression to eat. That is exactly like Moby was when he was little. Man, that's amazing. It is. Man, you gotta love it. It's so exciting to know that it's almost guaranteed that there's a future 10-pounder sitting right inside of this 5-gallon bucket. So that water temperature in the bucket's rising up, and they're starting to get a little more acclimated. And I want to take just a second to talk about our other pet bass, Bonnie and Clyde and Moby. So we built the 5-acre pond just for our pet bass back home. But the one reason I didn't want to add them in the pond yet is because I want to give all of these bass fry an opportunity to grow up without having any bigger predators in the pond. Because bass will eat other bass, and these little guys are the size of a minnow right now. So it's almost guaranteed if we were to put the pets in first, they would have eaten some of these. So it'll only take them about six months to get up to around a pound. So I'm thinking sometime this fall we'll put the pets in. So folks, it feels like we're in a movie. It's been bluebird skies all day. But right whenever the bass are about to go into the pond, it's like the sky started building up the drama. <laughs> and this storm represents the storm that we're about to unleash into this pond. Alright, it is time to release the babies into their new home. And we're going to release them over here in the shallow end of the pond, away from all of the feeders, just in case one of those big bluegill was hungry. We don't want them to grab one of these little guys. And they're off. And the timing was literally dead on. The storm hit right whenever we released them into the pond. And folks, just like you've seen at this pond location in the past, it's either feast or famine. 
We don't get any of those light thunderstorms. Whenever it rains, it pours. And I mean, it is flooding. Bond's getting out of here just in time because we've got a major storm coming through. So while the storm is fitting for what I see as one of the conclusions of the five acre pond build, it is keeping us from seeing some of that crazy footage we would have seen if we would have had good weather. So I had some underwater cameras set up and we were gonna get some of those good angles of all these new bass feeding on all of the smaller fish. But unfortunately, the heavy winds and rain have muddied up all the water. But even with these muddy water conditions, here's the first sign that you can tell that the bass are already eaten. So if you missed the last video, I bought a pit tagging system that we're gonna to use to tag some of the bass and track their progress. It uses a little RFID tag and when you scan it, it comes up with a unique code. And in the last video, I asked that you all help me name the first 104 bass that we catch. And we're doing this to track their growth, but we're also gonna have some contests and have a little fun with it in the future. So if you look at the left column, that's some of the fish names that were suggested. And the column right beside it is the YouTuber that suggested it. And the way this is gonna work is all of these fish are gonna have unique tags. So when we catch them in the future, we're gonna have contests. And if your fish is caught and wins any of these categories, we're gonna give away cash prizes and trips out here to the pond in the future. So folks, leave some more fish name comments down below. I was pretty impressed with a lot of the names you guys came up with, especially those hard letters like Q and Z. And hey, we even have a Karen bass. That's gonna be the one complaining about the water conditions or the lack of food. But leave those names down below. We still have about 75 to fill in on this list. So before the bass arrived today, I filmed some feeding clips. So let's check out all of the other fish in the pond. We have two feeders that go off three times a day and they feed two different size of protein pellets. They look like piranhas at the surface. Now let's get an underwater look. So it always starts off with the fathead minnows. They seem to hang around the shallow water pretty much all day, every day. And now you can see we have some bluegills coming in. And one of the things I find interesting about them, they haven't really gotten their colors and darkened up like an adult bluegill will look. They're all still that pale white color, as opposed to those bass that start out with their full color patterns, even when they're fry. And we got Mr. Turtle coming through. And I'm not 100% sure how we got mosquito fish in the pond, maybe through birds, but those short round fish are mosquito fish. And now here's a good underwater look of the shad feeding, and they don't feed on the protein pellets. They actually feed on an algae bloom that was created by fertilizing the pond. So you see those little tiny bits of algae that are floating in the water? That's what you'll see them feeding on throughout the day. All right, back at one of my favorite spots in the cabin. I call it the lookout post. Got a great view of the pond here. You can see all the wildlife all the way back there to that wood line. Got the camera set up. If they get too far away, we just fly the drone out over the top of them. It's like I'm sitting here in my own little hideout. Can't beat it. So every week, the two owls that we call Hooter and Al Capone try to steal the show. And this week, we got some very interesting footage of them. So it's very rare for me to be able to film them during daylight, but they couldn't pass up the opportunity to take a dust bath in the dirt in an area that we had just cleared off. So I got some really cool footage of both of them bathing together. And another funny fact about this is they're only about 10 feet away from the cabin right there as well. But I really cannot believe what happens next. There's a third owl. Man, I cannot believe that. And I don't know if this is one that was just passing through, but I'm not an owl expert, but it looks like these are three adult owls and it's not one of their offspring. But now we have a group of owls and I learned something new today. A group of owls is called a parliament. So now we got a parliament of owls hanging out here at the farm. So folks, you know we got to do it. Leave your name suggestions for the third owl down below. And there's something so funny to me about watching an owl walk. <laughs> you can tell that one's excited. Now it's time to check on the newest members of the farm, and that is the six baby ducks that hatched a few weeks ago. This is our first time having baby ducks, and we've loved watching them play and grow. And the one thing I'm really surprised about is how much they eat. 
and also how much they grow. They definitely won't be baby ducks for long at the rate they're eating. And since we have so many predators around, we may not be able to release them into the pond. So if there's any of you out there that live around South Alabama and are in need of a duck, send us a message. We may have one for you. All right, folks, now that we're getting into the warm summer months, it is time to turn the diffusers on. So I'm down here at the compressor box. Make sure all three airlines are open before we get it powered up. All right, got it turned on here. There we go. So that's pretty cool. It actually makes the duck decoys swim around and makes them look a little bit more lifelike. So I have heard some mixed results about using diffusers. Some people say you don't need them, others see value in them. But the one thing that I have heard that's been pretty consistent is if you haven't been running them for a while, don't just turn them on and leave them on all day. So we're going to start on a schedule where we're running them 30 minutes a day and we'll basically double our time every day until we can work our way up to 24 hours. But if there's any pond owners out there that run diffusers, let me know your schedule and if you run them year round or just in the hotter months. So one of the things I'm very happy about is that we didn't make a negative impact on the wildlife out here at the farm. You can see all of these deer hanging out within 10 to 15 feet of our cabin that we put out here. And none of the animals seem to mind us being out here at all. They just carry on like we're not even here. And in fact, these deer are so comfortable that they even sleep in the backyard. <laughs> that to me is crazy. They've got hundreds of acres of fields and woods around here but they choose to lay down 15 feet away from the cabin. That's pretty wild. Well, we got our first shad spawn going on. See just thousands of them up here on the bank in that real shallow water. And all the way down the pond's edge. Now we'll do a quick feeding off the dock feeder. We feed them bigger pellets out of this feeder and you can definitely tell this is where all the bigger bluegills hang around. I mean, I wouldn't blame them. You got the oak thrown out there, a diffuser, a dock, and a feeder, and some pea gravel all around the dock. If I was a big bluegill, that's probably where I'd be. And it's time to feed Mr. Moby. So now that the pond build is complete and all of the fish are stocked, I want you all to leave me some comments down below on what type of videos you'd like to see in the future out here at the farm. One idea I have is that Moby's going to get moved out of the 300 gallon aquarium into the backyard pond and we could take one of these little bass fry that we just caught and put him in the 300 gallon aquarium and see if he's anywhere near as aggressive as Moby was. But I also want to take a second and thank each and every one of you that followed along this entire pond build series. This is something I've dreamed about doing since I was a kid, and you all helped me make that dream come true. So we will always be thankful for that. But I hope you all enjoyed this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can follow along as we try to turn one of these little bass fry into a 10-pounder.